Okay, I'm going to start out with an existential question. Why? Why do we exist? I'm not going to get into that, and the book doesn't get into that. But the book has a lot of whys, uh, and many of which may seem very existential to you guys. Uh, for example, uh, why will Amazon open brick and mortar stores? Why will all of e-commerce become experiential versus just convenience and price driven? Mind blower. Why is Procter & Gamble rolling on national chain of Tide dry cleaning stores and Mr. Clean car washes? Why will the wholesale brands accelerate their retail store openings? Big impact on a lot of your businesses. Why will 80% of traditional retailers' offerings end up being private label and or exclusive? Why will department stores roll out private branded specialty chains? Why are small store strategies accelerating across the boards? Why will pop-ups become a strategic priority versus a marketing tool? And why will department stores become enclosed mini malls, leasing space to brands and even competitors? And why will 50% of all brands and retailers disappear? Uh, why indeed? Um, and there are a lot of other whys in the books, the answers to which are really the new rules of uh, retail. And the biggest why, why are we in the midst of the biggest transformation in the history of uh, retailing? And why and how will the industry look at the end of this transformation? We actually uh, uh, track the evolution of retailing th through what we call the three waves of retailing. Uh, we also parallel track the consumer, uh, including the enormous power shift from producers to consumers, uh, now driving 70% of the G GDP in the United States, as you guys know. All right, wave one, roughly 1850 to 1950. Uh, and if you look at um, 21st century retailing today, uh, with all of the um, sophisticated uh, distribution, uh, the modern concepts, uh, uh, the internet, new technologies, and so forth, comparing it to the early parts of wave one, uh, where 60% of the people lived in the rural areas, uh, there was very little access, if any, poor distribution, very low disposable income. Um, it actually almost looked like a third world country in the United States during this period. Uh, so <clears throat> people had to uh, uh, pretty much accept what they could get. So this was an area of producer power. Few producers, very little distribution, no real retail structure. Uh, we had a growing population of people that needed stuff, and because we couldn't make enough of it or distribute enough to serve those needs, as I said, they had to accept pretty much what they could get. Uh, Henry Ford used to say, you can have whatever model T you want, color model T you want, uh, as long as it is black. There were um, two major retail models during this period. Uh, first, the department stores, but very few of them, and they were only in the urban areas. And they were called palaces of consumption at the time uh, because they were huge, great experiences and really all-day outings for the, for the families that would come in, travel hours to get into the cities uh, to spend uh, the day with their families. Uh, the other retail model is Montgomery Ward and Sears Catalog. Sears quickly outstripped uh, Montgomery Ward. But um, for the 60% of the people who live in the rural areas, Sears Catalog was like the only retail store for them. Those folks would pour through hundreds of pages in their living rooms and literally order everything they needed from the cradle they were rocked into the uh, coffin that they were buried in. In fact, you could order your own home through, through the Sears Catalog. Okay, ramping up to wave two, um, Sears, 
Montgomery Ward, J.C. Penney uh, uh, opened stores, uh, and also more department stores came on stream into the uh, small but growing uh, towns and cities. And uh, by the way, what few brands there were during Wave One, they were single product brands uh, like Levi Jeans. Okay. Wave two, I call uh, capitalism unbounded. It's explosive growth in the United States. Uh, it, uh, the most explosive growth in the history of the world any place at any time. Uh, huge infrastructure building, distribution, transportation, communications. And in 1954, Dwight Eisenhower signed the uh, Federal Highway Act launching 46,000 miles of interstate uh, highway system. So not only mobility for the population to move from rural into the burbs and the cities, but what followed them, uh, regional malls, shopping centers, um, therefore the expansion of Penny Sears and all the department stores that anchored those malls. Uh, the uh, Kmart, Target, Walmart were launched in, in the mid-60s. And this was also the period that ignited the retail apparel specialists, uh, Gap, Esprit, and, and hundreds of others. So more and more competitors, more and more stores, more and more stuff in them. So when population and demand started to slow, uh, supply really did not. So as wave two evolved with more and more stores and stuff than people really needed, Consumers are gaining more power, power of choice, and they can now say, uh, you can't just build your store and expect us to come to you. You've got to give us a compelling reason to come to uh, your store and buy your stuff. So brands and retailers had to figure out how to create demand. Uh, thus, we shifted from a production-driven economy and industry to a marketing-driven economy and industry. So now, with the most sophisticated distribution infrastructure in the world, it was paralleled by the launch of big media, television, <coughs> national print media, and the period was appropriately called the period of mass markets and mass marketing to uh, serve it all. Uh, this was the mad period Mad Men were born, really called the golden age of advertising. Thousands of brands were launched across all industries. Uh, and then as night follows day, uh, these national brands with growing competition <coughs> had to begin to figure out how to elevate their demand creation to compel consumers away from the growing number of competitors. Thus, lifestyle brands were born. So from single product brands like Levi Jeans to lifestyle brands like Ralph Lauren, uh, which was, he launched the very first lifestyle brand in the mid-60s. Okay, on to wave three, which we are now in. And the first thing we did was to identify three game-changing, fundamentally disruptive events in the beginning of wave three and into wave three. And they were uh, the Explos one, the explosive growth coming out of wave two, which was continuing into wave three. And, and this converging at that point in time with the advent of technology and globalization. And of course, consumer at uh, the center of this. Technology and globalization, as we all know, uh, drove low cost production, more eff effective and efficient global distribution and the miracle of productivity, okay? The great news that we could make more for less. So more, more, more on top of more, aided and abetted by technology and globalization, uh, the great news of, of, of increased productivity, the great news that we could make more for less, uh, what happens, the great news that we can make more for less turns into the bad news, we made way more than we needed. So, the good news, however, 
consumer now has unlimited and instantaneous access to whatever their heart desires, right at their fingertips, a key tap away in a store across the street. So the power shift is complete from producers to consumers. This 150, 150 year period is being uh, matched around the world. Um, you know, the, 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 this cycle and these waves, uh, the emerging countries uh, like China, for example, will probably go through in 25 years. Um, anyway, consumer power, the power of total access, more and cheaper access through globalization, increased productivity, and uh, market saturation. Take a look at this. This is retail space expansion in the United States. Not a hiccup for like 40 years. Average 4% net growth a year versus the population growth of 1%. Lazard Fair did a study about 30 years ago that uh, found that uh, uh, there was twice as much space as demand warranted. So to give it a little color, we now have 20 square feet of space for every man, woman, and child in the United States. Uh, but now if you add to this the 55,000 square feet and under smaller shopping centers, malls, and moms and pops, that bar would go up to 46 square feet per capita. That's incredible. And <clears throat> how now would you translate the some 5 billion e-commerce websites into square footage? Well, nobody has really figured that out yet. You guys are brilliant numbers guys. <laughs> Maybe you can figure out how that works. Now what these stores are doing, they're just tossing in the uh, online sales into uh, same store sales, for example. Anyway, as I said, these buildings are not empty out there, which means we've got a huge expansion of stuff as well. Here's one category anecdotally. Uh, in 1980, there were like six blue jean brands. Today, there are over 800. In 1968, there was one Pringles brand. Today, there's like 33. There was one Tide brand. Now there's 39. In 1950s, the average supermarket carried 5,000 items. Uh, 90s, 30,000 today, over 100,000 items. More and cheaper access. Talk about cheaper. It used to cost about. Five bucks to make a t-shirt, today it's under half of that. Quicker and easier access through rapid, more responsive, multiple distribution platforms, including mobile devices and the internet, and smarter access through increased information and communications. Look at this mind blower, between 1999 and 2002, we stored enough information, <laughs> to fill 37,000 libraries of Congress. I don't know what that means, but that's a lot. Uh, and between 2002 and 2010, uh, it's increased by 10 times. And today, uh, this number is probably arguable, 50 billion websites. Um, and what would this be? The smartphone, I don't have to tell you, take it into a store, scan the barcode, and you get six stores around you. Uh, where you can buy it cheaper. And I'm told the next generation of this will give you not the exact brand or product, but like brands or products. I don't have to tell you guys, driving the retailers crazy. And when they're able to find like products on this, I mean, forget it. It's, it's nuts out there. The pricing situation and, and, and in the kind of deleveraging and the, it, it's, it's, it's almost, I, I've been writing some about this. It's like lowering all ships, and, and I, I, and there are some economists, it is deflating the aggregate value of everything. The, 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 the fastest growing retail segment uh, model in the United States are the outlet stores. I have to tell you guys this. You know that. The sister of the power total accessibility, total control. The consumer owns your businesses today. They control all of commerce for one simple reason. 
If you don't give them what their heart desires, they simply walk out the front door, across the street, into another store, tap into another website, accessing themselves to just another of hundreds, hundreds of equally compelling products. Think about that. And just to complete the loop on power, the whole dynamic of billet and they will come, the, the store in the center, the consumer going to the store, has been flipped on its head. The consumer is in the center, store must go to the consumer. And not just electronically, physically. That speaks to the small store strategies of every major retail format in the United States. And I'll come back to this a little bit. Um, $64,000 question is, uh, how do these brands and retailers get to those consumers first, faster, and more often than the hundreds of other equally compelling competitors? And if and when they do, what is it going to take to, op to open the consumer's pocketbooks? Well, we identified five <coughs> major consumer shifts. And the first of which is probably the most powerful, and that is from needing stuff in waves one and two, today demanding experiences. Stuff, and even new stuff, doesn't do it anymore. It is just the price of entry. Consumers expect great new product all the time, but today they now want experiences. I mean, the big game changer, of course, was from Maxwell House in a can to the whole world of experience at, at Starbucks. It's a, it's, it's a difference between shopping for stuff on sale in a great big store and the addictive online experience of guilt groups, online flash sales. Um, the, the difference between buying a computer off a shelf in CompUSA to Apple difference between uh, buying a pair of pants off the shelf and the Abercrombie & Fitch nightclub. Or the, the difference between buying a, a yoga wear off a rack to Lululemon's uh, yoga classes, from supermarkets to Trader Joe's. So we'll, we'll come back to this in a minute. From conformity to customization, uh, it is from people needing to feel included in wave two uh, to wave three, consumers are pursuing and searching for that special for me brand. Uh, consumers in wave two thought it was cool to wear the same brand that all their friends and relatives wore. People want cool today, but, but, but to their own definition of, of what cool means. This is a huge challenge to the mega brands like Gap, and Levi, I mean, think about it, in kind of ridiculous way. Levi in wave two, say one for every behind, and now you got over 800 blue jean brands, uh, one for each behind. Uh, it's it's the localization of all of these department stores, uh, the 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 local in neighborhood. Uh, matching consumer preferences and being able to do that almost down to the Nats eyelash. Best Buy opening a different store with different merchandise, different levels of service, different layout in a yuppie tech savvy neighborhood versus a whole different store and merchandise in a boomer challenged neighborhood. Ubiquity is antiquity today. It is buy by mainstream a thousand tiny consumer tribes. Wave three is going to be dotted with an infinite number of finite market niches being served by an infinite number of, uh, of uh, finite brands. Plutocracy to democracy just means that uh, this notion uh, that only the wealthy own everything luxury is it, to uh, democracy, affordable luxury for all. You guys know the drill here. It's Vera Wine at Kohl's. It's Nicole Miller, J.C. Penney, 
Carl Lagerfeld for H&M, Massimo, Cynthia Raleigh, all of those designers at Target. And this is accelerating and will continue to accelerate for all kinds of reasons. New to new and now used to be enough, as I said, to, 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 to a new brand, a new product, a new style. It would win. Forget about it. We live in a 24-7 world today. Wherever, uh, so whatever a brand or retail, retailer creates today, it is knocked off tomorrow morning. So we have to knock ourselves off every day of the week. This has spawned the whole fast fashion industry. Zara, H&M, Mango, Forever 21, Uniqlo, and on and on and on, and it will continue. Zara, um, arguably, and I think this is correct, uh, delivers two new lines of merchandise every single week to their 2,000 stores around the world, new and now and more often. Uh, obviously, it's an internet world today, a key tap away now. It's a brand knocking on your front door. It's a branded party in your living room now. Wave three is a whole bunch of new stuff in our faces when and where we want them now. Self to community. This is a big cultural deal. It, 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 it's, it's beginning to emerge and with millennials, uh, certainly not my generation, um, it is from me, 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 and more, more, more to a total reassessment of value and values. Less is be beginning to become more. Quality starting to trump quantity. And ostentation is giving way to the understated. And sustainability is going to be a way of life. And I don't have to tell you about communities, this whole social network thing, the communities that are being built around it. It's, it's flipping traditional advertising and marketing on its head. You can no longer talk at these people. You have to figure out how to talk with and among them. You've got to be invited in. It's incredible. And, and uh, community is the new planet. Uh, all these cause-based retail models are, are sticking. They aren't just marketing tools today. Walmart is probably the greatest retailer in terms of the number of initiatives they have. I think I could go on for a half hour about them. Uh, people, you know, a lot, a lot of people are Walmart bashers, but I'm going to tell you something. What they're doing is very real. I mean, they, they can, they're forcing Procter & Gamble to reduce their package size by 25%. And there's probably 20 other things they're doing. Uh, Brian Dunn says doing, the CEO of Best Buy says doing good is doing well. And of course, they get the world's largest electronics garbage recycler. Um, CEO of Rue La La, uh, when the earthquake hit Haiti, they closed their site down and said, uh, you know, whatever you're going to spend with, me, uh, with us today, send it, send it down to Haiti. Okay. So these five shifts. What strategies and therefore new business models necessary to execute those strategies is it going to take to win this consumer's uh, dollar in what is essentially a share wars marketplace? I don't have to tell you to grow. You've got to either steal a consumer away from a competitor or you've got to get your consumer to buy more and or more often from you. Fundamental overcapacity, which for a lot of reasons isn't going to go away. And, and that's a whole other thesis. So share wars on top of now the winning market characteristics in Wave, wave 3. It's not enough to just to be marketing driven anymore. You've got to be better than ever in marketing, but now you also have to be distribution sophisticated, creating delivery, I mean, creating demand to get people to come to you isn't enough anymore. Now you got to deliver demand. And lifestyle brands aren't enough. Now they have to be lifestyle experiential. We're going from mass markets to finite markets and from mass marketing to micro marketing. So 
my co-author and I stepped back and we said, all right, here we are. In the midst of the most intensely competitive marketplace in the world, uh, so who are going to be the winners and who are going to be the losers, and more importantly, why and how? So we took a deep dive, these companies and a lot more, spent a lot of time. We believed <clears throat> that there had to be some profound differences among the winners that were uh, conspicuously absent among the losers. For example, why did uh, those two guys fail so miserably when their arch rivals uh, have succeeded so well? And we believe that even though Best Buy has hit a speed bump, they are strategically positioned to come out very well. We also believed that uh, there had to be some commonality among the real winners, not yet articulated, but that we could identify and, and, and create a cohesive picture of what the new strategies and uh, new business models uh, would be. So we spent a lot of time, talked to a lot of CEOs, went through a lot of companies, uh, research and so forth. And um, a lot of it's in the book. Uh, we didn't do a lot of charts, not a lot of numbers in the book. <laughs> Nobody wants to read that stuff. Um, so emerging themes, this is a no-brainer uh, today in, in, in this share wars, unbelievably competitive environment. Um, and by the way, it, it, this is, it's the same in Europe, it's the same in, except for the BRIC countries and those are really emerging and growing organically. You guys know this, share wars. So you really have to excel in every area, you're going to die. However, and this is the tough part, it's just the price of entry today. Uh, just to achieve competitive parity. And I use this analogy, you might get to the playoffs by being excelling in all areas of the value chain, but you're not going to win championships unless you're superior. Yes, every one of these retailers said, we are consumer centric, but the real winners were taking consumer knowledge to another superior level. Every one of them said we're going to elevate our experience, we are elevating our experiences. But the real winners took experience to another superior level. And of course all of them were operating on all distribution platforms, but the real winners understood distribution deeper and were taking it to another superior level. So the big revelation at the end of the day when we finally connected, got through the maze, connected the dots, and the tumblers fell in place. We identified three new rules of retail that the real winners were taking beyond excellence to another superior level. And the three uh, new rules, neurological connectivity, preemptive distribution, and superior value chain uh, control. Forget just experiences. We tapped into some new research methodology, uh, the neurosciences, which are all about how the human mind uh, reacts to external events around it, to the environment, and how the human mind will trigger behavior based on that. Experiences, even anticipation of experiences, would release a chemical in the human mind called dopamine, Secondly, the experience itself, um, maybe it's the Lululemon yoga class. And finally, the final fix um, would be in the consumption of the product or the brand itself. And it doesn't have to be coffee, uh, it can be the Apple computer that you're working on. Or the Zara dress that you, that you bought. Uh, speaking of which, the Zara addict uh, visits their stores 17 times a year versus uh, average of four for traditional retailing. Obviously, why? Because they don't want to miss what's new there twice a week. And by the way, if they're in that store and they see something they love, they are compelled to buy because they know it's not going to be there uh, next week. Um, the other major point about experiences uh, is that they are co-created 
by the consumer and the brand. And what I mean by that is, and this is really powerful stuff, a and F puts the nightclub out there for the consumer. When the consumer goes in there, however, they are shaping that nightclub experience to their mood of the moment, which means that every time they go back there, it is a unique and different experience. So not only does that entice the consumer to come back and back and back again, essentially to become an addict, uh, it elevates the value of that brand and store and everything in it, read purchasing power, pricing power, I'm sorry, major. Preemptive uh, distribution. This is synonymous with gaining preemptive access. What the real winners understand is that if the consumer has hundreds of equally compelling products right at their fingertips, they have to figure out how to preemptively distribute their value to get to that consumer first, faster, and more often ahead of those hundreds of other equally compelling competitors. What it means is obviously operating on a complex matrix of all distribution platforms, both electronically and physically, seamlessly and integrated. Uh, real tough stuff. It is about gaining quicker and easier access to consumers and providing quicker and easier access for consumers. The quintessential example I use of, 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 uh, of uh, preemptive distribution in the physical world is Kohl's department store. And I consulted with them for a while, so I know <laughs> What I'm about to tell you is true. Kohl's defined their core consumer as a 35 to 55 year old working mom with two kids who didn't have the time to go to or shop through the mall. So what do they do? They put their brand, their store right across the street in her neighborhood. Small store format, one floor, easily traversable, central checkout, huge parking lot. You talk about preemptive distribution, almost every penny of their $10 billion explosive growth during the 90s came right out of the hide of J.C. Penney. Not only did the CEO of J.C. Penney at the time acknowledge this, they turned right around and launched their own small store neighborhood off mall uh, strategy. Here's a little visual about how this works, St. Louis, Missouri. They find where the working moms are, and oh yes, they're about um, 20 minutes away. Here's the, there's the J.C. Penney store, and there's Kohl's, and you visually see the difference. I mean, uh, sh this should be a little faster. Anyway. <laughs> uh, Another example, obviously, Amazon Prime, free next day delivery. How do they do this? They locate their distribution centers right across the street from uh, UPS. Tesco Home Plus in Korea, some of you may know this. Um, they built a virtual store in a subway. Not the whole store, but let's say they take their beverage case and they put an image of it on the wall down in the subway so when the commuter gets off the subway, they can take their smartphone over to the be virtual beverage case, scan the barcode in iced tea, and have it automatically delivered uh, to the front door when they get there. The big aha for us <clears throat> on preemptive distribution, just like co-creating experience was a big aha. What would be, we said, wow, what would be the biggest preemptor of all? How about the neurologically connected consumer? The dopamine addict, uh, the, the, the loyal Starbucks or Lululemon customer will travel a couple miles across town when they might have a coffee or yoga shop right across uh, the street. What is that, what's the lesson there? You create enough of a, an overwhelming experience and you'll drag that consumer away from the internet regardless of price. And the last new rule. 
without which renders the other two absolutely useless. Simply but profoundly transformational is the bare fact that without superior value chain control, you cannot achieve that level of experience or preemptive distribution. The winners control their value chain. They may not own it all, but they control it. Zara comes the closest, I think, of most of them we talked to that almost own 90% of it. But for sure, the winners absolutely control the three most important areas that touch the consumer. One up front when they're learning and researching what the consumer is dreaming for. Secondly, they must control the creation of that dream and all the marketing around it and so on and so on. And then third, when the dream, including the addictive experience, touches the consumer at point of sale. Those three areas are absolutely imperative. And just to emphasize the, the uh, importance of value chain control very quickly, is quite a bit about it in the book. We, had, we identified three core principles that the winners are constantly focusing on. One, increasing collaboration. And that's not only with their consumers, it's with their vendors and suppliers um, and their retailers. And they are also internally uh, integrating their organizations uh, to elevate more collaboration. Secondly, they are shrinking decision times across the value chain from product development all the way through to inventory flow into the store and out of the store. Um, and again, there's a lot more on these in the book. And finally, they are investing big time and in, in, in creating totally consumer responsive pull value chains rather than the old forecast push value chains. In essence, a, a, a totally integrated seamless value chain from creation all the way through to consumption. Okay, finally to quantify some of this um, research and to kind of justify our thesis, um, we um, uh, selected um, randomly uh, uh, retail brands uh, from across several industries, apparel, uh, consumer electronics, um, department stores, home, food, drug stores. Uh, and we uh, had them ranked by consultants, executives, analysts, and so forth. Uh, and then we put them into four buckets, kind of, from, from poor to good. And <clears throat> what we found out is that between 2002 and 2007, the um, good bucket, those companies that really uh, took <laughs> collaboration, shrinking decision times, and su seamless supply chains to another superior level. Um, by the way, to be begin with, these companies were essentially all the same market cap, okay? but. Uh, they created 55% of, of market value between 2002 and 2007. Now, even through the recession, because these guys walked the walk and could take those principles to another superior level, even through the recession, they ended up, after that, uh, providing 73% of market value. And not only did the lowest quartile not create any value, 25% uh, of them went out of business. So we, we predict that something like 50% uh, of brands and retailers uh, will disappear in, in, in wave three simply because they won't be able to make the transformation to be able to achieve some level of success across uh, our three new rules. So as this transformation plays out, and as the winners continue to pursue superiority in these three new rules, they will continue to change their strategy, adopt new strategies, and therefore new business models necessary to execute those strategies, and thereby they will change the face of retailing. 
and they will make all of these wise and many more predictions in the book. They'll make them all come true.